Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being with us as we come to you through the Emerald Planet from Washington, D.C. as we look around the globe in 143 different nations looking at those best practices that are going to address the issues of severe climate change, of quality water, of alternative production of energy, and many of the other issues that address the quality of life for some seven billion souls. And as you know, through the Emerald Planet, the whole notion of the climate change and the population uh, impact is going to some nine billion people by 2050. And so we're looking at those issues that we need to address now so that we have the quality of life and we have experts that are working with us, coming to you from all over the globe to address these issues. And we have uh, Dr. Uh, Kat Schreier, who is, uh, has her own consulting work, works with uh, some of the major universities and research institutions around the United States. And she's going to be talking about some of the work that she's been doing through her WaterCat Consulting and working with other areas. So Kat, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Glad to have you here. And uh, talking about some of the, uh, the work you've been doing, I know this whole thing, we're talking about uh, building communities mm -hmm. and uh, the impact of having communities and all that. So uh, tell us a little bit about your work and also about your consulting. Uh, well, I've been working on uh, uh, building communities through facilitating communication and understanding on approaches to sustainable water management and policy. Uh, we met through uh, some work I did at UDC. Yeah, with the University the, of District of Columbia, right? so we, full right. disclosure. Absolutely. Um, I've been under contract with them to put together something called the DC Area water issues program. And later in the program, you're going to hear from a couple of the folks that we've been working with um, on, uh, uh, on some work in the Anacostia. And, and that was a, uh, overall the, the DC area water issues program. The, the goal was to create a more cohesive water community in the area. Through now, well, when you're looking at this whole notion of uh, community development and looking at the uh, community process, many people look at water as it's kind of a technical thing. You go find the water, you figure out how to filter it, you put it in a pipe somewhere and it comes out of somebody's uh, faucet at the end, but yet okay. there's really, a, that's only a small part of that. And so this whole thing of community process, getting people involved, why is that really important as we move through the 21st century? Oh, that's, that's, it's absolutely critical to understand that there is so much more to dealing with water than just the technical aspects. Um, although it is important to have science-based policy, to, to understand the physical surroundings, in, and we are in the process of learning much more about that through understanding things like climate change. Um, but also understanding the, uh, the other aspects. If you want to take a more sustainable approach that incorporates people, prosperity, and the planet. Yeah, let's bring up this first slide, and we'll have some of this here as far as uh, some of the things that are going on. Just keep talking. But we just want to have this as a backdrop because uh, people look at this. But this whole thing of building communities and building it around, and when you take water, you're really extrapolating that to air and, and the land at the same time with water as the base of that. So again, going back to this whole notion of building community and, and getting people involved, what is the process that you do working with communities and how do you work with them to help right. them understand everything that really is going on and why they need to participate? Well, and that actually, you'll see on the next slide, I'll, uh, just real quickly while we have this up, uh, sorry, back up. Um, the, uh, well, this, this here is, is some of the steps that can be used uh, that, that I've found to be very effective over the years in working with everything from agencies to community groups to universities to large oil companies. Um, that uh, there's, there's several steps towards building community. Well, the whole thing about it, Kat, is that we're looking at it, and of course, Every human being, every being, meaning mm -hmm. animals and insects and everything else, directly relate to water. 
And so even though it's kind of like uh, in the old days, kind of like with school teachers, we're the experts, leave it to us, we'll take care of all this. Right. But in today's world, it really doesn't work like that, is that everyone is affected by water, the, the cost is going to increase because of the, the lack of water in uh, many areas, the expanding population base. So how do you sensitize? How do you get people to say, we need to take ownership of this whole issue of water and become involved? Well, and these are, these are the steps that, that I've shown here. Um, one is generally uh, education and outreach. Um, doing things like putting together programs like the weekly program that we've done at uh, the University of District of Columbia, uh, specialized forums, uh, specialized programs particularly for particular um, communities, communities within a community. Um, and, and later on I've, I've got some slides that look at bringing together the water and energy communities. That's one thing Which that's is very really important because it's, it's not just one stovepipe like water talking to one stovepipe like government exactly. or to energy or to food producers, but everybody needs to be part of this. And I think this is what you're talking about in your surveys and your benchmarking is that it really is important to reach out and find out what different uh, disparate groups are doing exactly. and also the community and then how that can be incorporated into uh, policy and uh, the program awareness that you're talking about uh, through these slides. Now looking at this as a uh, integrated and whole community, um, how, how do you do that? I mean, you're a very dynamic woman, but I mean, you know, getting your arms around all these people, that's, well, that's a tough job. This is, this, is a, this is a particular case study I, I particularly like, is, is looking at the challenge of integrating water and energy. And, and that's become a very hot issue lately, uh, this, this idea that, oh my God, water and energy are connected, there's this nexus and, and water is, you know, you need water for energy, energy for water. You also need to think about water resources management, rivers and aquifers that need both water for energy and for water supply. Um, and if you look at this, this is a, a graphic that, that uh, uh, Electric Power Research Institute has used to, to help uh, Department of Energy and the National Energy Labs to communicate this concept. Well, also, too, energy. this is very important that we communicate to the youth uh, of uh, you know, within the school divisions so that they go back and tell their parents and their grandparents and their extended families that, you know, every time we use our water, we turn on the tap you know, we're directly affecting uh, so many other people and so many other facilities and agencies. That is true, but often when people are talking about education, they, they do kind of fixate on, on school-age kids and on universities and you know, future generations. But well, the, the whole is, thing is, is that, you know, you reach the parents through the kids. That's, and so that's, that's very, one way. very important that's one way. to But do our, our leadership also is learning to incorporate new approaches, to think about sustainability, to do what they've been doing in a different way. So often, uh, I'll be working with, uh, say, an agency or associations. Which some of these to, are actually shown here. Exactly. Well, this is, this is uh, an approach that we took in this, this larger picture for, for DOE and National Energy Labs and the Groundwater Protection Council on creating a water energy sustainability symposium. And uh, in order to get the full picture, we invited in uh, 26 different uh, water energy and power associations to make sure that we were getting all these different perspectives. That's step one, is just understanding each other and what are your different perspectives. Water perspectives on energy, energy perspectives on water. But I think, ways. Kat, this just, it's incredible though. If you look at this, and of course, if you actually really extrapolate this across the, the broad sectum, you'd have, you know, all the communities of faith, you would have, mm -hmm. you know, many other civil, civil society organizations involved in this. You know, these are kind of the quote unquote, the professionals involved in it, but it really extends. So it's right. really something that we have to look at very carefully. We have to involve as many people as, as possible and just really reach out into the community and say, look, this is the future, this is where we're going in the 21st century, and how do you want to be a part of that? And probably the other statement is you have to be a part of that. Absolutely, absolutely. In different communities, in different organizations, uh, this next slide is looking at um, uh, how water resources planning on a river basin scale, which is in itself a shift that has occurred within water supply, of looking at it not just as the water buffaloes, the big water entities, but also thinking about the habitat users and the recreational users and the agricultural users and the urban users all together 
um, within a base. And energy usually doesn't have a seat at the table in those sorts of roundtable discussions about watershed planning. And that is something that, that energy certainly is a, it's a, it's a big player. It's a, it's a grill in the room. But um, when it comes to water management, water needs to bring energy to the table. So that's been an approach that we've taken there. And I think the last slide is looking at, again, looking back at the, uh, the DC Area Water Issues Program, uh, that we've tried to look at several of these types of issues, water and energy, uh, gardening programs, um, habitat programs, multi-governments working, uh, multiple governments working together on watershed planning um, on a weekly basis. Uh, and we have two other programs coming up that I just want to mention before we go. The last two of the semester, one is on wastewater, okay. Uh, looking at the, uh, the whole thing that we're talking about here as far as getting people involved, uh, putting on the seminars, the, having the surveys, doing the uh, benchmarking, uh, we have about a minute and a half left. How should people really start thinking themselves about what's going on as far as the water right. and where we're going in the future with all of this? Well, there's, there's really two levels to this. One is on a, on a professional level is thinking through how does your profession interact with water, whether you are in an energy industry or manufacturing business, whether you're in an agency, what is your role within that agency of, of having different policies uh, what, what, just within your office. Well, off looking at, at, look at this as a, as a true professional, and I've mm -hmm. been very impressed with you know, what you're doing, how you're reaching out to the community, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that chart was very telling as far as involving all these many different agencies and all that. How can the citizens become engaged? Because you're speaking to people around the globe right now. So how exactly. do they become exactly. involved in their future as it relates to water? Well, it, and that's the other side of that, is that each of us, you know, we have our, our life engaging within the community and within however we, it is that we earn our living, but we're also all individuals that live within a certain place and we are within a certain watershed. Um, it's, it's really important for people to understand where do they get their own water from? What are the water issues in their own area? Well, areas? it comes out of the tap, of course. Everybody knows that. It's just like milk comes out of a bottle, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Food comes from a supermarket. There you go. Yes. So looking at this whole thing, and we have about uh, 15 seconds, what would, what's the message that you want to leave with the viewing public as far as become involved, how to do it? Uh, get to know your own community. What are the communities? Think about what the communities that you're involved with in terms of where you live, in terms of what you do, in terms of your families, in terms of your society around you. You are a part of community. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic, and thank you for being with us in this segment of the Emerald Planet. We have some other coming on. We create the Emerald Planet. Around the world, one out of every three women will be beaten or otherwise abused in their lifetime, often by a family member or loved one. A future free from violence. It's all she's ever wished for. Did you know you have the power to stop children from joining gangs? You can help a father find a job and home for his family. You can assist a woman who can't afford the medicine she needs to live in the home she can't live without. You can choose to make a difference in our community. Support Volunteers of America, and you can help improve the lives of nearly 2 million Americans each year with programs and services that help individuals and families overcome their challenges to become as independent as possible. Support the programs that are working in our community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. For some folks, saving for the future is easy, but for you, it might take a little more effort. Saving for your future is your responsibility, and there's a lot to save for. I never thought of that. Like your child's education, perhaps uncovered medical expenses, or just to be sure you can live the way you want when you retire. The time is now for tomorrow. 
Save now or work forever. The choice is yours. Choose to save. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe at the issues that are facing some 7 billion souls on this planet. Regardless of what country you're in, the one thing that each of us have in common, absolutely in common, is the notion of water. Without it, none of us can survive. So whether you're a human being or a being, insect or what have you, water really is the essence of everything that's going on around us. But yet, because it's been so cheap, so plentiful in most places that we just don't really think about it. As we're talking about in our last segment is where does water come from? Out of the tap is what most people would say. Or now more and more it's coming from uh, plastic bottles and uh, maybe in uh, some countries delivered in uh, tanker trucks. But yet it comes to our door in most places. It's uh, very uh, inexpensive. And yet, as we know in the globe, is that it's becoming more and more scarce as climate change is affecting the rain patterns and also the amount and the flow of water uh, across the globe. And we have our expert with us, Irv Sheffy, who is here with us. He's with the Sierra Club, and uh, he's one of their uh, national representatives, and uh, we're really pleased to have you. Well, it's good to be here. I was uh, in a seminar where Irv was uh, speaking for full disclosure, and when he got up, he has this command of presence, and I was quite impressed. And then he starts going on the whole issue of what we have to face as far as the, the coming uh, decades, as far as water is concerned. But also, the fact is, you really had some solutions, was uh, what I thought was uh, quite important. But we're going to start with this first slide here. And this is something that we, uh, Irv, we all know about as far as these issues. Tell us a little bit about this, how the Sierra uh, Club is involved, okay. and then we're just going to progress right through sure. uh, what the, the viewing public needs to know about. Well, if I may, let me give you a little bit of background. I'm with the uh, Environmental Justice and Community Partnerships Program within the Sierra Club, and we've got organizers around the country working with local communities on a community scale about issues facing environmental justice communities, usually uh, communities of color or low income. And I'm focused here largely in the Washington metropolitan area, but I work with colleagues around the country from Flagstaff, Arizona, down to New Orleans, down to the hills of Central Appalachia, and industrial cities like Memphis and Detroit and St. Paul. Well, with Sierra Club, though, it's uh, the very big, however many years it's located. I mean, it really is a, a touchstone all across the globe. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the importance of all this, is how do we extrapolate what's going on within Washington, D.C., with the United States, and then reach out to the uh, 213 other uh, nations or whatever number it is uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But looking at these issues that we have here, uh, just tell us about some of the problems we're facing uh, today in the 21st century, and then where we're going to be 2030, 2040, and 2050. Well, I think one of the things you mentioned a little earlier is that uh, we think water is cheap. We, we take it for granted too often. We don't consider it a real commodity that needs to be taken care of. And one of the things to do, and what I engage in, is working with local communities, making them much more sensitive to the fact that this is a, a precious resource. Uh, get them out on the rivers locally here, namely the Anacostia River, which is often called the Forgotten River, because most people, when they think of Washington, D.C., they think Potomac. And what we've seen conditions along the Anacostia degrade over several years, and now start to turn around because of community involvement. Getting people out on the river, rowing on the boats, getting them involved in cleanups of the parks, getting them educated about what needs to be done to make that a quality river and uh, swimmable and fishable again, according to Clean Water Act. Well, you know, the whole thing about this is getting uh, community involvement. Uh, you know, we had an expert uh, earlier was talking about this whole thing about how you get all these disparate groups involved. Mm -hmm. You have the government, you have private sector, civil society, uh, the communities of faith, all of them to be, be involved. But yet, you know, again, water is so ubiquitous that we don't really think of it. It's just we go to the tap, we go to the refrigerator, yeah. what have it is. So how do we raise this awareness, Irv, so that people truly think about it, not the fact that they've come obsessed with it, but mm -hmm. how they truly think about it, where it comes from, how we're using it, and then how can we conserve it? Well, I have what I call my triple A theory of activism. Most of the time we talk to people, get active, get engaged, go out and sign a petition, see a, a congressperson, see a council member, 
take action. But we need to have people to go back a couple steps and f simply be aware that there's an issue present. Okay, so uh, the first day is awareness. And the second one is once you're aware, you notice that this is something I want to protect. So appreciation comes into play. Fantastic, appreciation. And then from there, people take action. So we do a lot of public education, getting people literally out on the river. And that's what we're seeing here is that people getting engaged, being involved, uh, having appreciation for uh, what's going on. Yeah. So how do you get people to become involved? I mean, everybody's busy. Uh, you know, most of the world's population now live in urban areas, so uh, there's more uh, pressure to do things, mm -hmm. to uh, be engaged in the community, not so much with their families as in years past. So how do you really get them engaged through what the work you're doing with the Sierra Club? Well, one is we go to the schools. We get involved with local school groups a lot of schools have service learning projects going on we get the young people engaged and they bring that message home so you know we should take care we don't run that water so long it's a precious resource we've got to take care of it put that light bulb in and change it from fluorescent to CFL things of that nature so we kind of have a little pincher movement working from the young people into their families and then bringing them all out to various community events cleanups and celebrations and get people to really know that it's more than just work you, on this next slide you're showing right now that's a celebration we've had for the last four years going on the fifth one it's I on think this is an absolute incredible uh, uh, photograph because I've been involved actually with the Anacostia River I've helped with a couple of the mm. cleanups and, and I quite enjoy it but I tell you it is messy out there it and it's usually cold uh, when you're going out to do that kind of work and it's wet well this particular day is Martin Luther King Day which is in January it can be very very cold we had people last year on the 20th uh, next year January 17th we're having another event like that and rain or shine wet cold people come on out now looking at this now I am thinking back to about two years ago when I was in uh, Varanasi in India mm. and they were actually organizing something like this so if you kind of change the the style of clothing and the the trees <laughs> in the background yeah. It's really very similar, but the whole thing about it, and I, it's really kind of uh, interesting, that, you know, the India, the Washington DEC example is how can people uh, extrapolate this across the globe and get involved in their local communities, and then why should they really want to get involved in their local communities? Well, it's because it's their community. That's the key thing. I think you have to appeal to the fact that... So take ownership of take where ownership. you live this and, is where and the I resources live. there. And make that place a learning laboratory for a lot of personal behaviors as well as educational programs. And also too, just the, the natural beauty, this, yeah. this particular slide that we have right here is yeah. just really telling as far as uh, what's going on. And how do we get to this point? You know, we think about, you know, minus the canoes that we have here, uh, this looks almost pristine, but yet mm -hmm. we know there's, there's trouble in the kingdom. Yes, yeah, so this is the upper Anacostia River. We're never going to turn the entire river to that because we've had, you know, development all the way along it, or over the course of the years. But we can improve the water quality as such. We can put less pollutants into it. We can affect it differently by dealing with trash. We have 20 million tons of trash every year coming down the river. And that's who's the problem there? We are. You know, well, the whole thing about this, and this goes back to climate change, people are saying, well, is it the natural ebb and flow of the climate? Is it uh, humankind? But it's, the fact is that climate change is happening regardless of the source of it, yeah. and we need to deal with it and address it. So looking at this pristine photograph right here in the center, I learned from uh, some of your colleagues at the Anacostia Watershed uh, Society mm. that the Anacostia at one time was almost 40 feet deep, Yes. and uh, now it's about two. Yes. And so you have all the sludge, you got all the uh, runoff and all that. So what needs to be done to get back to this pristine state? Well, what we're doing is encouraging people to plant trees, plant wetlands along the coast of the river. Uh, we're getting more and more involved with letting people know how their household habits can affect the quality of the river. Don't throw things down the drains, doing drain markings, things of that nature. So we're engaging the public on a wider and wider level. We have several sub-watershed groups throughout the Anacostia watershed that are engaged in doing education with their local communities. Now looking at this map here, let's, let's talk about this as far as the watershed. And the reason I'm using this, again, this is a, a kind of a model, a, mm -hmm. a uh, example, if you will, for people that are living here and, and uh, abroad. So how, looking at this whole notion of a watershed, how do you define a watershed yeah. and how do I know what it really is? I'm glad you asked. A lot of people ask that question, don't really know. We tend to use a lot of terms. Let's go back to this. Okay, good. So if you, think of, if you think of a watershed as simply a tub, 
where you have rainfall, the shower, coming down and hitting all the sides of the tub and eventually draining to one point. In this case, water, snow melt-off comes throughout Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and collects into very streamlets and into various tributaries and ultimately comes down to Bladensburg, Maryland, and forms the river, which flows past and through D.C., ultimately going to another watershed, Potomac, and ultimately it's one of the largest in the world, the Chesapeake. And then going to one of the largest in the world is the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. Ocean. So all of this is really uh, interconnected. I'm going to leave this up for just a minute, sure. uh, talking about this as far as the watershed. If, if I'm in India, I'm in South Africa, I'm in Denmark, these places, how do I find out the, the defined area of my water, you know, my watershed in those areas, and then be sure that I'm having a positive impact on it, not a negative one? Well, I'm sure there are local groups like groups we have here who are engaged in watersheds. Uh, they probably could find that information out very easily. I mean, Sierra Club is present around the country and in Canada as well. We do have even programs overseas. And uh, the UN is also a good resource in terms of that because they're involved in watershed issues around the world. I mean, going back to your notion about the three A's, the triple A you were talking about, sure. uh, we only have about two minutes left. Talk about those three A's and well, let's relate that to the community and how they can become engaged with you, with their communities of faith, whatever is important to mm -hmm. them in order to enhance those three A's. Well, one of the things I do, I do a lot of deep sensing. I go out to a number of community groups where I live. I get involved in various civic associations, advisory neighborhood commissions and the like to let them know I'm just here. Just be a presence in the first place. Get I think involved. that's what was really impressive. What you talk, When you started your uh, speech over at uh, UDC, the mm -hmm. University of District of Columbia, I was very impressed with that where you go out and you literally you just kind of take your cup of coffee and sit down mm -hmm. and just observe people and yeah. let them kind of mill around you yeah. and get to know who they are and what they're doing. And listen to them. Listen to what their issues and concerns are. And if they're not aware of some issues, you'd like to, do you know? Did you, are you aware? Just plant the seed and see what happens there and just be there to help grow it. Okay, going back to these three A's, let's enumerate the three A's okay. and again how this is, uh, can be extrapolated across communities mm -hmm. and across nations. Simply awareness, smell the roses, get to know your neighborhood, get to know the people who are there, who can make a change and, and get involved. Uh, and treat them to get involved. Show them what the value of dealing with water or other environmental issues might be. If they don't, something else may occur. So get involved. And then take the actions that will actually make a difference. Okay, taking action. Now, uh, we have about uh, 30 seconds left, so looking at action, people say, well, geez, I don't know where I need to be connected, how I get involved. When you say action, what do you really mean, Irv, and, and how can they do it? Come outdoors. There's several events throughout the year, from Earth Day all the way through the fall and during the winter, as I mentioned. There's opportunities galore. Just get in touch with what's going on in your neighborhood, and you probably can get involved and make that difference I mentioned. Okay, now, if I'm a citizen, I want to bring awareness to my community of faith and to my community and to the school. How can I do that? Well, they can contact me, and they can contact your program, and they can find out my details. I'm more than willing to talk to people about what they're doing locally and beyond. And also get involved with their schools oh. and, and everybody that's around them. Without a doubt. Thank you for being with us, Irv, and thank, thank you. you for sharing with us as we look around the globe and this whole notion of water, how we can protect it, how we can increase the quality as we create the Emerald Planet. One day these rats will play in the woods. One of some matches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about three thousand. Just force, what you desire. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. 
one that has extended hours, six days a week, year round, with loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged, where teachers have more time to teach, and students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and thank you for being with us as we come to you from Washington, D.C. We're talking about water, water quality, its sources, and how we can protect it, enhance it, and use it through the very best purposes into the future. And so what we have, we have a number of experts that are sharing with us of their expertise, their energies, their talents, and the time they're putting in to protect the water here in the Washington, D.C. area, but also they're very much involved around the United States, North America, and overseas. And so we have one of those uh, outstanding leaders that's here with us. Her name is uh, Dottie Younger. She is executive director of something that's called the Anacostia River Keeper. And it doesn't have an S on there. It says River Keeper. So that means there's a real responsibility that you have for this whole thing. So Dottie Younger, tell us a little bit about the Anacostia River Keeper. And I understand this is actually not just uh, within the D.C. area, this is really an international movement. So tell us about it. Well, thanks for having me, Dr. Sam. And so, yeah, let me say a little bit about Anacostia River Keeper. I am the Anacostia River Keeper, so the public advocate for that's, the that's river. That's a lot of weight on the shoulders, isn't it, to it, be able to keep a whole river? That's, it, I'm impressed. It is a lot of weight. Um, there's plenty of job security in this position, I often joke, um, because this river does need a lot of keeping. Um, but I'm in some very good company. There are 16 water keepers that are throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so each one of us is the public advocate for our particular river. We are the eyes and the ears and the voice for our river. And we're from a larger, now international movement called Waterkeeper Alliance which is a movement to put public advocates on water bodies. It started within the United States, but now it's moved to um, across the world as you well. You know, this is a whole thing that I find very fascinating about this because we're talking about uh, community involvement, community engagement, and how this really is, needs to be, not just need to be, it must be a, a global movement because as water becomes more precious, it's, uh, more people trying to use that, and also it's going to become much more expensive. So looking at this uh, river keeper and extrapolate that to the globe, uh, many societies is that's the government's job. Mm. In America, we have volunteers and we, we do these kinds of things. But overseas, they, they look at pay my taxes, the government takes care of it, and I want it in pristine shape. But now you're saying is that people are actually becoming engaged overseas. So how, how did this movement get out there? How did this mm -hmm. message get across and people are actually becoming engaged. Well, it started 10 years ago in this country. It started just with a group of fishermen on the Hudson River who were fishing and they realized that they weren't catching as many fish as they used to and the fish they were catching were sick. And so they started to investigate what was making these fish sick and they realized that the new plant that had just gone on the Hudson River was discharging pollution into the Hudson River. Now what kind of plant was this? So this was a plant, this was a, a plant, a General Electric plant and they were discharging uh, the waste that they were producing from that plant directly into the Hudson River. And we have very good environmental laws in this country, Dr. Sam. What we don't always do is enforce them very well. And, and so make sure that they take responsibility, whether it's the corporation, but also just the, the towns and cities need to take responsibility for their discharge as well. Exactly. And so this group of fishermen got together. They did water sampling. They collected data and information. They took pictures. Um, and they built a case, and then they sued General Electric for, um, for contaminating their river. The oh, you, you mean a, a group of fishermen got together and said, look, I don't care if you are a titan of industry, we're going to take you on because you're messing up our river. Exactly. In this country, like I said, we have very good environmental laws, and the Clean Water Act 
provides for citizens to be able to sue polluters when they take away our public right to this public resource. The water, the air we breathe, these are public resources. And to some extent, we've turned them over to corporations and to the government and said, you can do with them what you will. But they belong to us. They belong to everyone. Well, this is what's called the common good. And this goes all the way back to, uh, you know, over a thousand years of what's called English common law. And, of course, uh, the French and the Belgians and the Germans, the Austrians all have a similar kind of system. But the whole notion is, is that there are certain things that are held in trust mm -hmm. and they need to be for the good of the public. So looking at that, we're, we've extrapolated out to the world. The Riverkeeper is becoming uh, global. And so citizens, I don't know what countries, but say India and Denmark and places are becoming involved in that. But bringing that back down into Washington, D.C., how do we stake our claim on our river, and actually rivers, but our river, the Anacostia, and also the Potomac, and how does this river keeper yourself uh, get all these people engaged? I mean, that's it's just a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but one of the things that we do is we are a membership organization. We represent the Anacostia River itself, and we represent all the communities that live, work, and play within its watershed. So the area of land that is connected to the Anacostia River, that is its watershed, and everybody who lives, works, and plays there has a right to a clean, healthy Anacostia. So this is for swimmable. our international folks. So this part of this uh, Clean Water Act then allows and gives them a platform, a legal platform, that they can say something's not right here and we want to address it and take care of it. Yes, and so what I do is I visit community groups, I visit boating associations, I visit houses of worship, anywhere where the community is in contact with the river or used to be in contact with the river but isn't anymore because it's polluted. And I listen to what their concerns are about the river and about the environment. And then I let them know about things like the Clean Water Act and various laws and legislation and regulations that have been enacted to help clean up the river. And we use advocacy and enforcement to then get polluters and government agencies and politicians to, to uphold the laws, to pay attention to the laws that have been passed to protect this public uh, resource. Well, Dottie, you shared some uh, slide with us. I want to bring up a few of those, and we're just going to have these kind of uh, going in the, in the, uh, the background as we uh, talk through this whole thing. So if we can bring up the, uh, the first slide, and I'm just going to kind of uh, go through so we don't need to talk about these directly. But looking at this whole notion as far as natural resources, air, uh, land, and water as uh, something that's uh, held in trust as a, as a sovereign nation, uh, how, do you, how do you share that information but impress upon people that you really do care? And it's not just the fact you pay your water bill and you dispose of, you know, to keep the, the garbage out of, of the waterway, but you really have to be invested in this because this is your future. One of the things that I do is when I talk with communities of folks um, who live or work or play in the Anacostia watershed, I, I listen to how they use the river or would like to use the river. And we're looking at a slide here that's absolutely the wrong way. This is exactly. the, the worst practice when we talk about that. Uh, of what we're doing because uh, plastic bags, all these other things uh, end up in a tributary and that affects everything we're doing, even the quality of the drinking water we have. Absolutely. And we know that plastic bags make up a quarter of all the trash in the main stem of the Anacostia. It makes up almost half of the trash in the sub-tributaries. And so um, it's one of the things that makes the river no longer fishable or swimmable. Um, and, but that is something that we can do. We can change our behavior to keep trash out of the river. And, we and allow sure. this wildlife to, uh, to flourish in, in these areas and, uh, and just have this kind of uh, impact. But this is something that I think that you've been in, involved in and also others as far as trying to clean up the river. Now, this is really a foreign concept in most nations of going out and cleaning up the river. Again, that's a government function. But we're saying here is that citizens who live and, and work and recreate here, it's your job. Exactly, and that's one of the things that we ask citizens to do when the Anacostia River Cleanup and Protection Act of 2009 was passed. So that was the act that put a five cent user fee on all plastic bags and paper bags in the district. 
to encourage folks to start using cloth bags when they go to the grocery store. I understand store. that's had a real positive impact. It has a huge positive in impact in two ways. One, it's reducing the amount of plastic bags that end up in the river. So rowers, like you see on the screen now, who are out every day rowing um, for health and for enjoyment, they're not worried about the plastic bags that are in the river. This is just an example of the way the trash collects in the Anacostia River when it rains really hard. It's one of those myths about trash and about the plastic bags. At first, folks were not happy about having to pay five cents for a plastic bag. We used to get plastic bags for free, is what they said. But it was a myth that those plastic bags were ever free. Because what happened is they ended up in the river, like you see on the screen right now. And then uh, District Department of the Environment, DC Water, District um, Public Works had to go out and clean up that trash out of the river. And that costs. And so we pay for that cleanup in our taxes. So it was never true that we were getting those bags for free. We paid for it with a dirty river and by having to pay the government agencies to go out and collect our trash that we were adding well, to the Well, it's river. also, too, it's not just the dirty river, it's the dirty water because the, the cost of treating that water uh, increases uh, dramatically because these plastic bags, they break up in uh, minute parts, so you have to continually just strain and uh, have more uh, acute uh, treatment of that water. Mm -hmm. And also, in general, it affects the, the wildlife that's in there, the fish and the... the uh, uh, the uh, fowl and all that they're using it so it really is it's just the cost all the way across the board so the whole notion of what you're doing Dottie through this Anacostia Riverkeeper and uh, across the globe is the fact is do it it's a good thing but also it's going to decrease the cost for the community and also for your family exactly those plastic bags never really go away in the environment they break down into tiny parts. Scientists call them nurdles. Um, they're always in the environment. Um, birds like the ospreys that we've been seeing pictures of ingest them when they ingest fish that have ingested them. We eat the fish, we ingest them, or the plastic ends up out in the Atlantic Ocean or in the Pacific Ocean and you get, get the great trash patch which is this huge floating Well, they're saying mass it's, a, it's larger than the state of Texas exactly. now. That's amazing, and it's all swirling out there. And, of course, again, it's affecting the, uh, the quality of life for all of us because uh, even though three-quarters of the earth is covered by oceans, we need all of that because right. there's a different, different, different reason it's out there. But looking at what uh, can be done in the future, we only have about uh, 40 seconds left. What would you like to share for our viewing audience here and, and around the globe as far as what can they do to get involved with their river keeper and why it's important? Right, so you can go to Waterkeeper Alliance online and you can search to find the water keeper, the river keeper that is in your area, and then you can contact that river keeper. And those river keepers do things like cleanups, um, community, uh, come to community events, but they also do advocacy and enforcement. So if you see pollution, you can report that pollution to your water keeper. Your water keeper knows the government agencies to go to in your watershed and will report that and then let you know if that cleanup has happened. So you can be a direct change agent in your community to get pollution cleaned up. Fantastic summary. Couldn't be any better than that. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours six days a week, year-round, with loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged, where teachers have more time to teach, and students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-2-LEARN. to -learn. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your Social Security Statement of Your Benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much Social Security you're eligible to receive, 
and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement. Because that's coming too. The future in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash meth. <laughs> We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Thank you for being with us as we come to you from the United States, Washington, D.C. specifically, as we're looking at the whole issue of water, how it's being used, what needs to be done for the future, and how can we involve the communities. This whole notion of best practices is as we're looking at the whole notion of the water and the best ways that we can guard it as we're looking at seven billion souls trying to divide up the water resources that we have. We know that uh, three-fourths of the water on the Earth's surface is in the oceans. Very salty. We can't use it. And if you look at the extrapolate all that information out, and we have an expert sitting right beside me. She may correct my numbers. My understanding is it's only about 3% of all the water on the face of the Earth that actually is usable for human beings. So how do we get involved? as citizens? How do we get involved to protect this precious resource? And how do we use these organizations and the folks that are sitting right beside me here to become involved yourself to do this? Not only here, it doesn't matter what country you're in, but get involved. So we have uh, Dr. Kat Shire, who is uh, working with her own company and uh, consulting and uh, doing uh, great work there and also works with uh, the universities. Uh, within our community, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Irv uh, Sheffy, who is with the Sierra Club, and I've been very impressed with everything you have to say as far as community involvement and the way you go about doing that. And then a woman who must have the broadest shoulders in, in the whole globe. She actually takes care of a whole river. I'm impressed with that, Dottie uh, Younger, Executive Director of the Anacostia River Keeper. But uh, Dr. Cat, if I can call you that, I want to start off with you because you've been engaged with uh, UDC, mm -hmm. University of District of Columbia. You have your own consulting work. So what is the personal passion beyond just the professional commitment you have as far as water and making sure that we protect that for our future? Mm. Well, I really got involved with water in uh, an interest in, in community building and, and collaborative planning and, and working on natural resources in a broader sense. How do we bring together different communities around natural resources and particularly about water? When you deal with water, you're dealing with lives and livelihoods. And, and that's something that's really very unique about water. The way we think about water, the way we experience water. Um, Nobody's made a movie called a, a, a power line runs through it. it you know, rivers are something that touch us at our soul. It is something that we connect with. We think about where we're from in terms of, of the water, uh, the rivers in our area where we grew up uh, and how we use that wet river, how we But it's recreate. more just than just ingesting the water. It's just the fact oh, that we go to the beach. Uh, we have little waterfalls within our offices. Uh, you know, there's just something about water is just because it is the essence of life and it's really the essence of our whole being. But Irv, talking about your work with the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. it's uh, very impressive where uh, I like this notion of where you just go and listen to people. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what Dr. Cat was saying is that, you know, water is the essence of us, that we're you're using it, it's around us all the time, but yet human beings are around us all the time and they're the ones that are either impa impacting this either for positive or ill and so how do you use these listening ears that you have to make sure that uh, people are doing it for good and not for ill well i think in the first place everybody's an environmentalist if you eat live breathe walk on this earth you're environmentalist even though you might not claim it i think everybody realizes on some basic level that they need to protect where they live. They may not be engaged, 
And that's where I come in. I try to offer opportunities for people to be engaged. For instance, Sierra Club's got 1.3 million members across the nation, all volunteers, people who said, I want to do something about something, namely my community and the environment. I want to appeal to those people and the people who may be on the fringe of that group to get more and more engaged. And it's just being there and letting them know what the issues are and how they can take action. Well, uh, Dottie, talking about the, uh, the river keeper and, and uh, your job really is to focus on that river. Understand there are a number of hot spots uh, within the river and what is a hot spot and how does that negatively impact the community? And then we're going to let Dr. Cat talk about how we're going to clean it up and, and take care of it. All right, so the Anacostia is an urban river and there are six known spots along this river that have contamination, that have toxic pollution. Oh, okay, so when we say hot, we're really talking about chemicals yes. or something there is very negative, and that has a long-term impact? That has a long-term impact both on the land itself, and some of, those, some of these areas are now parklands, um, which is concerning for folks, and that that toxins, those toxins that are on the land, make their way into the river as well. And so now we have toxic hot spots in the river. We know that two thirds of all the brown bullhead catfish in the river, for example, have cancerous lesions or sores. There's a fishing advisory to not eat the catfish in the Anacostia River. But yet we know that there are folks out there catching fish for subsistence reasons, just to put food on the table. And they may not know about those advisories. So it's a real, it's an environmental issue, but it's a real public health issue as well. Now looking at this whole thing, and then I do want to go to Dr. Cat as far as how we're going to take care of these hot spots, but also the, the river. But looking at this subsistence uh, fishing, I mean, this is something that most people don't really think about, particularly in the United States. But when you leave our borders, most, uh, much of the fishing, it really is subsistence fishing. So uh, looking at your Riverkeeper uh, comrades across the globe, what are they doing to help people that really do need to have this as a basic source of protein, but a low cost source of protein? Well, this is what water keepers do, is that they make sure that, um, that folks know about the pollution that is in their watershed. Um, th there's, there's, no other, there's no other solution except to not eat the fish. And so it really, folks need to know about the fishing advisories. It's, it's also an environmental justice issue um, because it is most often low income and minority folks that are fishing for subsistence reasons, but may also not know about the fishing advisory. And so really there needs to be an education campaign to let folks know about the fishing advisories to be eating alternative kinds of protein but then to also be pressuring their governments to address the contamination um, so that one day they can be eating the fish safely out of the river. Well, Irv, let's, I'm going to let you pop in here. This, this really is a natural hook talking about this, uh, this whole notion of social and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And that's really the very core of who you are and, right. and what you're doing and what you're communicating through the uh, Sierra Club. Talk about this whole notion of, uh, of this justice. Uh, how do you feel like it needs to be applied? And if not, how do you force the issue so that people really are getting justice? Well, basically, again, I keep going back to the theme of raising awareness. People need to know what's available to them to take action. And that could be political action. That could be on the ground in terms of cleanups, things of that nature. That could be drain stenciling. It's a number of things depending upon a person's level of comfort and their level of engagement. Uh, one of the big things, as Dottie just mentioned, is letting our public officials know that we need something done about these issues so that we can all live with our what is there on Friday? Well, Dr. Community engagement, something, the essence of you and your core of what you're doing. So, how do people that are, in many cases, their income levels, all of a sudden become lobbyists and you know, all because if they're not working, they're not uh, earning or not being able to take care of their families. So how do we have this balance so that people truly feel like they're involved, they're engaged, they're having an impact, but yet it's not the fact is taking away their day-to-day -day livelihood? Well, we need to make it easier for people to engage. And 
Um, and, and that is something that we try to do. How, how do you institutionalize these sorts of programs? What, what Sierra Club has done, what the River Keepers have done, of creating an opportunity for people both to learn and feedback of what do they actually think about these issues? How is it affecting them in ways that people are trying to figure this out from, you know, way up at, at not recognize that there are effects on, on the recreation. So we really need to turn this pyramid, this old proverbial, turn it upside down and allow the, the, the mass of the people to really feel like they're engaged. Absolutely. And they're, they're involved. Engage. How do you do that? This is something you've professionally been doing. How do you get Absolutely. these people involved? Uh, creating uh, forms that are open, that are easy for people to get to, um, always a challenge picking the right time of day, whether to serve bottled water or no bottled water. There's, a, there's lots of questions that go into the logistics of planning one of these events. But, but just to uh, provide an opportunity for people to come together, to make it easy for people to, to engage, to provide uh, uh, an opportunity for dialogue, that it's not just someone talking at people, but there is also an opportunity for people to communicate back. Um, and this it, is something I think you've really been doing through the, the work at UDC, the University of District of Columbia. I was very impressed that the number of community citizens that, were, that just showed up for, you know, the meeting and uh, that right. was very, and they were engaged. But are you taking it out to the public? Is that another way of reaching out so that they're not having to go to a university campus, but they're doing it in their, their church, their school, or whatever? Right. Well, and, and there's different programs that, that uh, need to occur in different settings. And, and part of this is also recognizing is who needs that information. So when, when DC Water, when Washington Aqueduct is, are making decisions about uh, are, they, are they looking at new treatment practices or new contaminants that, that uh, EPA is perhaps going to um, regulate in the future, um, how do they know what the public will respond well to or not respond well to you know, uh, with regards to health, with regards to uh, with aesthetics, how things taste and, and uh, taste and odor issues, um, and, and really also recognizing that that you know they say, well, you know, we get complaints when we do this, we get complaints when we do that. Well, part of it is just getting that two-way communication, letting people know, hey, you know, we had a rainstorm upstream, uh, something washed in, you might notice a difference in color. Well, Irv, talking about that again, going back to this uh, economic and social justice, and we have just a few minutes, mm -hmm. a few seconds left, actually. How do we actually take that into the community and make sure that at, at least we're providing the opportunity for engagement? I'm glad you asked that. Recently we started a series of uh, community forums uh, bringing the message out to local neighborhoods as opposed to downtown. We had one recently on building and creating vibrant, sustainable communities east of the river, east of the Anacostia in this case, and uh, had people actually generate their own agenda. As opposed to us talking down, they created it from the ground up. Doing things like that around water issues, around energy issues, et cetera, et cetera, will actually get people engaged because they're going to be talking about what's passionate for them. So you're being a facilitator, and I think, Dr. Yeah. Cad, that's what you're talking about, being a facilitator. Uh, Dottie, as a river keeper, 15 seconds. How do you reach that public? How do you get them engaged? How do you get them involved? You. Um you, what, I echo what Kat and Irvin said, you listen to them, you listen to what their concerns are, and then you empower them with the tools to be able to make the change. So the whole thing is, is to reach out to the community and make them feel like they're nurtured, bring them in, and uh, thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.